Oh, recently I started using some new software and even after just a few hours, I was able to transform one of my 2D designs into a delicious 3D icon that takes literally seconds to animate or for example, to make it follow the cursor around the screen. <laughs> because why not? It was, uh, it was fun. The 3D software is called Spline. It's free to get started and it's both very exciting and completely insane because the animation I just showed you is barely scratching the surface. So if that sounds like fun or you're interested in designing with 3D the easy way, then you can consider this video a crash course introduction to get you started. A spline is linked below if you'd like to check it out and it works directly in the browser or you can download the app for Mac OS and Windows. So here you can see I'm on the home screen. And if I go to the left hand side, I can view all of my files. There's also a community feed where you can post your own creations or you can view and remix other projects created by the Spline community. There's also a good old tutorials tab and these videos mostly cover specific features, which is very useful. And there's a library of pre-existing 3D projects and assets. You can filter these or search through them and simply double click to open the project. And you can also create a team and work collaboratively in real time. But because it's just me, I'm going to go back to home and then create a new file. Spline will do its thing. And we now have a new document with a bunch of presets. Or we could just click anywhere to hide this. Okay, so next we're going to familiarize ourselves with the three main panels as well as learn how to actually navigate a document, which I imagine is quite important. Yes, indeed, very important. So to start with at the top, we have the toolbar with, well, lots of tools. There's some soon to be AI features here, and we have a plus icon with a whole bunch of preset shapes. These range from 2D shapes to 3D shapes to cameras and even lighting. Over here, we have a few zoom related settings, which are very handy indeed. And alongside there's a button to export the project in a variety of different formats, or we can play and preview our project. Okay, so on the left hand side, we have a traditional layers panel where you can lock layers or hide and show layers and you can select multiple layers and group them together with command or control G. There's also a plus icon here if you'd like to have multiple scenes in your animation and each scene has its own set of layers. There's also an asset panel that enables you to manage things like components, essentially assets that will be reused across an entire document. And then in the top left corner, there's an arrow to go back to the home screen. And there's a menu with things like file, edit and view all combined into one. Now on the right hand side, we can change the frame and you can think of this as your artboard size and you can change things like the background color and turn on and off a bunch of effects with a simple toggle switch. You can also adjust settings for snapping and to access all of these settings, just make sure that you don't have any layers selected. You can also switch between any cameras you've added from this drop down at the top. And if you are working with multiple people, you'll be able to see who's live in the document up here as well as inviting other people to join the document. So for this first bit, let's switch back to responsive just so we get the whole workspace. Now by default, every new document comes with a two dimensional square and I can pan around this using the trackpad on my laptop or by holding the space bar and clicking and dragging. To zoom in and out, hold down command or control and use plus or minus, or you should be able to use the scroll wheel on your mouse. And I'm using Apple's magic mouse, which as you can see is quite sensitive. Now to orbit the camera, hold down alt or option and click and drag. And you can see the grid now a little bit easier. Now the red, green and blue correspond to the different axes. So if we click and drag on one of the colored arrows, we can move the object. If we click on a colored curved line, we can rotate the object. And if we click and drag on the colored circles, we can scale the object or use the three gray circles to move the object on two axes specifically. Now towards the bottom of the screen, you can click on the different points to snap to a certain elevation, whether it's front, side, top, or then back to that front view. There's also a shortcut for an isometric view, which is very useful. And you can switch to a perspective view if you'd like that real world camera distortion. Or you can switch back to orthographic, which essentially removes any sense of perspective. And lastly, we can also scale an object up or down from the gray squares in the corner. And you can also hold down alt or option and shift to scale proportionally from the center. Now, depending on what we have selected, the contextual panel on the right will only show options related to the currently selected object. So if you're trying to adjust the lighting and you have a cube selected, that's, um, that's probably not gonna work. So speaking of cube, I have one here and you can see the properties on the right hand side. At the top, we can add a state to this cube and we can also add events to trigger various animations. We've got a whole bunch of shape related properties here. There's a section to add and customize materials so we can add a new material there and there's a lot to choose from. And we can edit the specific properties by clicking the square alongside. There's also loads of awesome presets you can access here or you can just go ahead and create your own. Right, next we're going to start with a basic shape and look at how we can modify this with a little bit of modeling. 
So first of all, from the right hand side, I'm going to select smooth and edit. And this takes us inside the shape with a new toolbar at the top. Now the subdivision modifier adds more geometry to the shape. And along the top, we can choose to make a selection by the face an edge or a vertex. So for example, if I select this top face, I can adjust the position, scale and rotation for just this face. Next along, we have some very useful tools. We have extrude, inset, loop cut and edge slide. So first of all, let's start with extrude. And to activate this, click on the blue control point. And as you can see, I'm using this to make an extrusion on the selected face. Next along, we have inset. And for example, now I've done that, I can switch back to extrude and I can even extrude down as well as up. Now at the moment everything is looking a bit square, so let's introduce a bit more geometry by cranking up the subdivision modifier. However, you can see everything has become very rounded. And this is where loop cuts come in. So with this tool selected, I can hover around the design until I see the red guides, and I can simply click here to make a cut and it will add more geometry. Now if I switch over to edge slide, I can grab that loop cut and actually adjust the position. And you can see as I move that loop cut towards the bottom, the bottom becomes less rounded. And you can add these in a few key places to have lots of geometry and a really detailed 3D model, but without everything being perfectly rounded and smooth. Because I'm going to turn this into a mug, and of course a mug with a perfectly round bottom is just going to spill over and the tea will go everywhere. So yes, loop cuts, very useful. Now, if you do exit your shape by mistake, you can simply click edit mesh to go back inside and you can click the brush icon to go into sculpting mode. And there's a few different options here. As you can see, I'm no master sculptor, but uh, yeah, it's fun to play around with, especially if you want more organic shapes. Right, let's undo that and bring my mug back. And to exit the editing mode, you can click the X or just press escape on the keyboard. Right, let's switch back to that perfectly side on elevation because I'm now going to use another tool to draw a handle. So let's add a new path and this functions very similarly to the pen tool. So we can click and drag to add another point and then we can adjust the size from the panel on the right. And you can keep clicking and dragging to create a curve. So let's do something like this. So you can see I'm very quickly and easily drawing a handle and then you can use this selection tool to modify existing points. So let's just reshape this. There we go, nice. You can also double click anywhere on the workspace to exit that pen tooling path mode. And there we go, I would consider that a successful mug. And here I'm going to change the path shape. And as you can see, there's loads of other settings to play around with. One of which I'm going to use now, which is adjusting the scale for the start or end point. And this is very useful if you'd like to taper off that path. And there we go, I think that's, uh, that's looking pretty good. However, the mug is kind of floating. So I'm going to add a plane and I'm going to scale this up nice and big and then move this down. And you can see that light is casting a shadow and I can actually move the position of the light around as well. And with the light selected, remember there's lots of settings on the right hand side as well. So that's a quick introduction to modeling and it's honestly crazy how much you can create just by using a few basic shapes and some of the key tools. But next up, this is how I created that 3D icon design all the way back at the beginning of the video. So to start with, I added a cylinder and then positioned it in the center. And then I added a cube and very easily stacked this on top, increased the subdivision modifier, and then used the loop cut and edge slide features to modify the top. Now with both shapes selected, let's centrally align them both. There we go, and uh, I've created that, ta-da. Now let's squish the cylinder and move it up and then adjust the size and position of these top two pieces. There we go, that's looking about right. Now for the bottom, let's add another cube. And I've now gone underneath this to extrude it down. I'm going to scale this inwards towards the center and then extrude it down and then scale it in again. And again, I need to add more geometry to round it off, but this is far too rounded as you can see. So I've got to use loop cuts and edge slide along with everything else we've covered so far to shape this into, well, the right shape. Ah, there we go. So now we have lots of geometry and the curves in the right places. Now let's move it up. It's looking a bit chunky. So let's scale that down a pinch. And that is pretty much the modeling done. Right, now let's bring it to life with some materials. First of all, I'm going to switch out the solid color for depth. And if I click the square alongside, I can use these settings to add a delicious gradient. Let's go from like a reddy orange to a, an orangey yellow. And for this lovely gradient, let's change the type from radial to linear. And I can now adjust the position of each color to control where the gradient starts and ends. Oh, that's looking lovely. Now I can simply right click this, go to copy material, and then select the other shape, right click and select paste material. Just like that, it's that easy. Now for the bottom part, I need this to be a glass material. So let's change that solid color to a white. And then I'm going to add a couple of new layers. Now for the bottom one, I'm going to change this to glass. 
And for the top one, I'm going to change this to Fresnel. I think that's how you say it anyway. It's spelt Fresnel, bit weird. Anyway, let's reorder these layers and we now have a pretty decent glass effect. But let's add one more layer and make this even more reflective by adding a matte cap. And from here, there's lots of really cool presets. So I'm going to select this one and change the blending mode to screen. And remember, all of these have their own properties. So with the glass, for example, we can adjust how blurry objects appear that are on the other side of the glass. So uh, let's give this a bit of blur for dramatic effect. Lovely. And I'm also going to add one more depth layer at the very top. And let's change the gradient so that it runs from a white to a kind of orangey color. And I'm going to use this to cast an orange glow from the top part of the 3D model onto the glass. So again, let's change the type to linear. And then let's change the direction so the gradient runs vertically. Now let's zoom out and adjust the position of those colors so we have a bit more red at the top and a bit more white taking up the bottom. And now if we change the blending mode to overlay, you'll see that the white disappears and we now have a nice orangey glow at the top of the glass. Right, let's switch back to that front elevation. And next I'd like to add a border. So for this, I'm going to add a 2D square and position it so it's central. And from the properties on the right, let's increase the corner radius and then increase the extrusion so it's actually 3D. Now there's also settings for bevel as well, which we can use and to soften the edges ever so slightly. And now that's done, I'm going to duplicate this shape with command or control D and then scale this one out on the Z axis and move it back. Now let's scale it down towards the center, adjust the corner radius. And with both objects selected, I can subtract the middle one from the outer one, thus leaving me a kind of border a frame. Now let's scale down the eyedropper tool so it fits in the middle and from the top elevation make sure they're both centrally aligned and I can now copy that lovely bright gradient material and paste that onto this border as well. And because it's a different size I will need to adjust the position of those colors as well and let's rotate the object in the middle 45 degrees and before we go any further we can group everything together and let's give this a name. 3D icon seems appropriate and if I add the group for the border I can then add an event I can change this from start to look at, and by default it's set to look at the camera. Let's click play, and now the border will follow my cursor around the screen. Now let's select the group for the object, and we're going to add a state. And with that second state already selected, let's change the Y rotation to 360. And then let's add an event, and select transition. Let's click this again to open up the settings. And we'd like to animate from that base state to the second state. Change the type to linear so there's no easing. This means the animation won't speed up or slow down and it will remain constant. And I would like this to loop forever. Okay, let's click play and see what we've got. <laughs> Oops, uh, perhaps a bit too fast. Let's change the speed from one to three. And there we go, much better. The border will now follow my cursor and the eyedropper will rotate continuously regardless. And as you can see, this is a lot of fun. Okay, so now everything's done. I'm going to select a frame size. Let's go for 1080 by 1080. And then I can adjust the zoom. I can pan around, basically compose the scene within the camera view, ready to export the final animation. And something else I love is that Spline integrates directly with the website builder Webflow, which coincidentally is the platform that I use for my website. So here's another one I made earlier. And if I click export, there's a ton of different options. I can select public URL and copy this link. But if I switch to viewer, I can copy this link here. I can then import this into platforms like Webflow. So let's switch over to Webflow, click the plus to add a new element, go down to spline, drag it in, and then paste the link in the box that pops up. Yes, it's literally that easy. Now let's pop this in the center. There we go and preview the page. And you can see the spline scene works directly on the page and this is a great way to add interactivity to a website. There's also an event called screen resize which effectively makes your spline scene responsive, which as you can imagine is great for anything on a website. And another feature that was recently updated is called Gaussian splatting. And this involves using your smartphone to take a 3D scan of a person, an object, basically whatever you like and then bring it into spline. Not to mention the ability to use physics and game logic to create playable games that you can, well, play. And like I said, this video, it's barely scratching the surface of what is actually possible. Also, do we need to talk about that name? Gaussian splatting. That's very strange, right? Like that could have been 3D. It could have been something kinky. Oh, we, we wouldn't have known. Also, if you did get to the end of the video, just type something like pink panda pajamas in the comments. I don't know. Let's cause a bit of chaos and confusion. All the people that didn't quite get to the end or have just joined the video will be like, what is going on here? And lastly, but by no means leastly, thank you so much to Spline for sponsoring this video and to you for watching. Take care and I'll see you next time.